just by way of background, right? I, I used to be um, an analyst um, at a hedge fund working on an oil desk, right? So I, I basically understand oil um, to a very, very deep level. Um, although I haven't been in that world for, for a while, mm-hmm. um, nothing really has, has changed dramatically in the past few years to, you know, basically make my knowledge be scale or stale. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the first thing to understand is what the incentives are in, in capitalism, right? So basically the way that capitalism works is that if someone has um, some money, right? Let's say you've got you know, five million bucks sitting around, um, you can either put it in a bank account, right? Um, and maybe accrue some very small amount of interest on that or just keep it in cash. But what ends up happening is that over time, the, the, the price of things has a tendency to rise. And so the purchasing power of your money erodes away. So instead, your alternative as, um, as a person who has money is to go out and find things that you can basically contribute your money to that will give you some rate of return, right? So basically, you give me, you know, 10 bucks, um, and then I give you, you know, two years from now, 12 bucks or 20 bucks. Mm-hmm. And there's in terms of thinking about how you weigh the attractiveness of an investment, there's two things that you care about as an investor, obviously. First, the magnitude of how much money you're going to get back, right? So like just arithmetically, right? Getting $2 back is better than getting 50 cents. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing that you care about is how quickly am I going to get my money back? So if I give you, if you give me a dollar and I give you $2 tomorrow, then obviously that's preferable than if I were to give you $2 a year from now. Right. So that's, that's, that's basically, that's capitalism summarized in, you know, 30 seconds. Right. Right, right. What, what, what do you care about? Right. What do, what do sort of investors care about? Mm -hmm. So now you think about um, energy, right? So if you think about needing a certain unit, of uh, energy in order to perform a quantum of work. It's not exactly um, fungible, but, you know, say for for the sake of argument, it it is, right? So you can go out and you can drill a well, you can drill an oil well, and it'll spit out some, you know, certain amount of energy. Mm -hmm. Or you can go out and you can build um, a solar farm, right? And your solar farm will also spit out a certain amount of energy. And so if you, if you say, you know, ultimately that a unit of energy at the point of use, which, you know, means, let's say in your home, is, um, is sort of fungible, you don't, you don't, you don't really care, right? Uh, you're kind of indifferent as to what the, 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 the source of, of your power is so you can imagine you know, kind of cr- constructing an ideological framework where one is, is exchangeable for the other. So what you can do is you can basically go through this thought experiment of, okay, um, how much energy do I get back um, for drilling an oil well and how much or, and how big of a solar farm would I have to construct? in order to um, get back that same amount of energy. And, and I, I, I won't walk you through the, the calculation because it's like nerd stuff and this is already probably really boring. So you'll just have to take my, uh, my word for it. But basically what, what you end up finding is that um, in order to return, um, you know, um, the same amount of, of energy that's in one oil well in like the Permian Basin in Texas, you have to build um, a solar facility that's, you know, something like, I don't know, a hundred acres. Mm-hmm. And so 
and then you think about the costs, right, the sort of relative costs of those investments, um, an oil well costs six million dollars to drill, roughly six or seven million bucks. Mm -hmm. And that same solar facility would cost you thirty million dollars. So just from a pure like unit of energy per unit of money return basis, oil is five times more capital efficient than solar is. Mm -hmm. That's one piece of it. Yeah. The second piece of it is the solar facility will return its energy basically linearly. And there's some degradation in, in panels or whatever over a 20 year life. The oil well will return probably three quarters of its oil within its first three years of operation, almost a hundred percent, you know, within its first um, five years of operation. Mm. So you go back and you think about what we were talking about earlier, right? What are the things that you care about as a capitalist? How much money do you get back based on your initial investment, right? Mm -hmm. So to get the same amount of energy, you have to invest five times as much in solar. Mm -hmm. The second piece of it is how much faster do you get your money back? One of them returns energy over, you know, a 20 year life. The other returns energy in three years. Mm -hmm. From a capitalistic perspective, there's no competition, right? Right. Oil is massively, massively, massively more capital efficient than renewable energy is. And that's not even to get into like, you know, the externalities of renewable energy, which are, which are myriad. Right. But just like purely how do we shift the energy system away from fossil fuels? This is the dynamic that's in play. Oh, and by the way, the barrel of oil, you can move it. You can refine it into gasoline. You can pour it into your tank. Mm -hmm. The energy of the solar facility produces is getting produced out in the middle of nowhere in the desert in Nevada where nobody lives. You still have to move that power to centers of operation. And to be able to put it to use doing things that, you know, are not electrically driven requires another series of very expensive investments in things like batteries and things like energy storage. Mm -hmm. So it is structurally disadvantaged to a massive, massive, massive degree. Mm -hmm. And so what, 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 is, what does that mean? It, it means that if you just let capitalism run its course, which is what we're doing and what we're going to be doing for the foreseeable future, renewables will never win. And we see that, right? That's, that is the root cause of why the energy distribution of the world is evolving in the way that it is, where the vast majority of consumption is from fossil fuels and renewables take up a tiny little sliver of growth. And it's basically purely because, um, you know, renewable energy exists to the extent that it's subsidized by governments. Because in the absence of those government subsidies from just a pure profitability perspective, it gets completely dusted by fossil fuels. Mm -hmm in terms of being like an attractive incentive. Yeah. So, so what, where, where, where does that leave us, right? That, that leaves us basically uh, in a situation where if you're assuming that ultimately the goal is let's transition society to a hundred percent clean energy, we're the only way that we can do that is to rely on the governments of the world to basically build this infrastructure for us because it's essentially um, completely unprofitable. Mm -hmm. And so within the constraints of, of capitalism, right? That's, that's just never, that's never going to happen. And there might be people out there who, you know, would sort of poo poo that statement and be like, well, 
no, that's not true. Like maybe if we vote in different people, mm-hmm. it would be better. Or like maybe we'll get the hang of this. But like we've, we've known about this climate change thing since the 70s, right? Yeah. And emissions are only going in one direction. That's up and to the right. And so if you believe, like I believe, that you know past performance is the best indicator of future results, mm-hmm. it hasn't happened yet, so it ain't going to happen. So yeah. that's, that's the like macroeconomic incentive piece. And then on that, you layer on the fact that fossil fuels are actively being subsidized by the government, right? So what, one thing that if, if there's a piece of homework for folks who are listening to this, go um, Google the intangible drilling credit. And what this is, is that it's basically a mechanism that allows oil companies to perform their accounting in a certain way that as long as they continue to drill, as long as they continue to drill and continue to expand production, they don't pay taxes. Wow. So that's something that's very interesting that I think a lot of people don't know, that basically exploration and production companies don't pay taxes because of this intangible drilling thing, which basically what what it does is it lets them um, net out the cost, not the entire cost, but most of the cost of drilling a new well, they can net that out of their earnings. So they can say, okay, I earned, you know, a hundred million dollars this year, but I spent, you know, way in excess of that, call it $200 million drilling new wells. Therefore my profit is minus 100. Mm-hmm. And so as long as they're continuing to drill, they never pay tax. Oh. And it's funny because I, when I was an analyst on the desk, I would value these companies and you'd have these conversations with these, these Wall Street banks all the time. And like I, I worked for a shop that was particularly like ultra detail oriented. And so one of the things I would try to do is figure out, OK, like what about what about the taxes? Right. Because you care about all the, the cash flows in order to arrive at ultimately what what the correct stock price is. And I would talk to these analysts at at, at major Wall Street banks, and they would be like, oh, like exploration production companies don't pay taxes. (laughs) Uh, They do pay taxes, it's just deferred. They will will ultimately pay their taxes far, far, far in the future. But like by the time that those taxes come due, I mean, we're we're, we're, we're cooked. (laughs) (laughs) Like literally, literally, right? We're cooked. Oh my god! So, so that's that's really interesting, right? Because like you, you, you have these guys, you know, they're up there talking about, um, you know, how do we incentivize renewables or whatever. But like, how about if we're really serious about transitioning away from this stuff, how about we stop actively subsidizing fossil fuel companies, which we do. Yeah. <sighs> and then you have sovereigns as well. You have sovereign governments that like the Saudis are a great example of this, that their, their, their entire national project is, is tied to, to the fortunes of oil. Right. And then yeah. they're, sure they're, they're trying to do stuff to try to diversify away from it. But like, let's, let's be real. Right. They're not, they're, it ain't, it ain't working. Um, no one's, no one's going to build a, you know, a, a multi-trillion dollar economy on, on the line or whatever it is they're calling that thing. Like a, it's, it's, it's oil or bust. Right. Yeah. So the, the incentives that are in place to, to keep the oil coming are massively, massively overwhelming. Yeah. Well, let's ask this, because in these like collapse circles, you know, one of the things that's been talked about for a long time is peak oil. I mean, this idea that we're running out of cheap, attainable oil and that they're resorting to more expensive, energy-intensive means to extract and refine oil. I mean, what is, mm-hmm. what is, what is your thoughts on that? I think there's some truth to that. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's some truth to that. I, I also, so if you think about, again, I'm going to date myself a little bit, but back when I was doing this work, which was not too long ago, um, one of the things that you're, you're interested in is sort of the, the cost curve, right? How much does it cost an individual entity to produce a, a barrel of oil. And, and why is that an interesting figure? Because if you say, okay, you know, these many people can produce oil for, for this price. And obviously the, the, the more and more 
expensive it, it, it or the more and more barrels you produce, the more and more expensive it gets. Mm-hmm. And that forms what's basically called the, the, the cost curve of oil, right? So how much does it cost to produce a certain quantity of oil? And you map against that what's global demand and where you know, global demand basically intersects global su- supply lets you form an opinion on what the price of oil is going to be. And so um, when, when, when people talk about, you know, more and more energy intensive um, forms of oil extraction, um, it's, it's true, right? So if you, if you look at like the, the incremental cost of, of a barrel of oil out of like a Gawar oil field in Saudi Arabia, it's like 20 bucks as mm-hmm. opposed to a barrel of oil um, that's produced, um, you know, from hydraulic fracturing in, um, in the Permian Basin, it's like, it's like 60 bucks, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think there's, there's, there's a couple of things to realize here. And, and one of the things that's missing from the, the peak oil analysis is that as you start to eat up those lower cost reserves, the price of oil climbs. As the price of oil climbs, it increases the incentive for exploring more marginal barrels. And so there's no, there's no shortage of oil. What there's a shortage of is a shortage of oil that's economically extractable, right? Mm-hmm. And so if, if, you, if you, you know, knock out the bottom 20% of oil supply or whatever, oil will go up to, you know, call it $100 a barrel. And then all of a sudden, the, the hydraulic fracturing exploitations of oil fields, which is something that we really perfected and specialized in in the United States, it's going to start taking place in other place, parts of the world, right? So China has shale reserves. Russia has shale reserves. Canada has shale reserves. Yeah. These people aren't dumb, right? They, they, they want to make money from that, right? So sure. if, if the price of oil goes up, um, all that stuff is, is going to start getting drilled and all that oil is going to come out. So like, sure, you might hit peak oil, right? But by the time you hit peak oil, you're going to have locked in 5C. And so who cares, right? It's sort of, it's sort of moot. Wow. That's one piece that's missing. The other, the other piece that they're missing too is that, you know, we always talk about technological advancement, particularly in renewable energy. But, um, you know, technological advancement is occurring in the oil industry too, right? These guys are always getting better at drilling wells faster, drilling wells longer, drilling wells more cheaply. That downward cost pressure, right, it, it exists for them too. And so, you know, whereas not too long ago, you know, a, a barrel of oil in the Permian Basin would have had to be, you know, 65 or $70 in order to be economic, in the best parts of the play, you know, it's fallen down to, to 40 bucks or 35 bucks. Wow. So it's a moving target, right? It's, it's, it's never, it's never a static picture. Right. Um, and there's, there's, there's not always going to be more where that came from. Right. But there's, there's a lot more than we can survive extracting. Let's put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> God. <laughs>